Being called to an inquest for a death that has happened in one of your care services can be a stressful prospect for anyone. To help understand how every care provider should respond in this set of circumstances, I sat down with Anna Maria Lemmer, who's one of the senior associate solicitors at Ridouts. Among other important subjects, we talk about how care providers can prepare for an inquest, what happens during the process of an inquest, and what the possible outcomes of an inquest can be. I'm Simon Parker, and this is the Care Leaders Network podcast. So here goes, inquests, what every care provider needs to know. So, Anna, what is the purpose of an inquest and in what circumstances are they required? So the purpose of an inquest, it's it's a coroner's investigation and the coroner is looking at four questions. So that's who the deceased person was, um, when they died, where they died and how they died. And the most important question really is, how the person died and the circumstances surrounding their death. So that's the purpose of a coroner's investigation. In terms of circumstances where they arise, um, they arise in different circumstances. So um, they might arise if a person has had an unnatural death or the cause is unknown, a violent death, or if uh, a death occurred in state detention, so in prison, for example. Um, but yes, it's, it's about answering the four questions, who, where, when and how the person died. Sure. Got you. And of course, I guess from a from a um, from a care provider set of circumstances, this is quite um, uh, a, a, an important set of circumstances to deal with diligently because of the uh, the level of emotion and things that's involved in the in the circumstances, of course. So getting this type of stuff right, uh, I, I'm guessing, is of. Uh, absolute importance yeah absolutely I I mean um there's there's various impacts um that can arise on on the back of an inquest so it is important to get it right at the outside and so preparation is really key sure sure and I guess like that being the case then so how how does a care provider go about preparing for that inquest and uh, I guess the ensuing process that would happen as a as a result of um, uh, of the inquest itself yeah yeah so um I mean I would uh, there's different ways to go about it so sometimes a coroner will contact a provider and ask them and, and say we need a witness um to talk about the circumstances surrounding the person's death um other times they they don't do that um and a a way about to go about it is to request interested person status so this is when you uh apply to the coroner and and request ip status Um, and what it does is it grants you access to information so you become a party to the coronial proceedings and you can play an active role in it if you if interested person status is granted it means that you can have access to the evidence that's available and that might include a post-mortem report for example um, which can help to which can help a provider's understanding in relation to, to what actually happened uh, and, and helps to understand what some of the issues are and, and maybe where the coroner is is going in terms of their investigation so interested person status is really helpful if on the other hand um or and and the two can be quite closely closely linked uh the coroner might say we need a witness statement from um you know the nurse on shift at the time the the time the incident occurred um so i can give you an example um of of of, of a case I've, i've recently worked on and it was in relation to a choking incident and a a resident in a care home died uh, as a result of choking and the coroner wanted witness statements from um, different people who were on shift uh, during during the time of the incident. Um, and, and what I did was I, I got involved at, at an early stage. So after the provider had already carried out some initial investigations in, in relation to the incident. Um, but then what I did is I, I spoke to uh, a number of staff members. So the nurse on shift, the care assistant, and also the registered manager. And I I covered different areas with them um, in order to address, you know, what it was the coroner wanted. So um, we looked at the staff member's professional background, 
um, and what their role involves day to day. Uh, we discuss the training they've had in relation to choking. Um, and, and then we, we actually, you know, talked about what happened during the incident and the action they took. Um, and they, these are really key details to get out in a witness statement. Um, and then we also explored whether any lessons had been learned. And, and that's where a statement from a registered manager can be really helpful um, because they're able to cover things at a sort of managerial level. And they talk about what was, you know, what was done on the ground and, and how they how they addressed addressed it with staff and, you know, what lessons were learned and, and how they went about it. The example in this case being all staff had refresher training in relation to choking. That can be really important, um, showing that remedial action has been taken after event because uh, it, it shows that it, the provider has taken it seriously and it, it limits the risk of a coroner producing or issuing what's known as a prevention of future death report. Um, which is something that they have a duty to issue if there are concerns that arise in an inquest. So providers want to try and reduce the risk of, of, of a coroner doing that. And if they show that remedial action has been taken, it's a really good way of, of going about it. I'd like to take a moment just to let you know about one of the sponsors of the Care Leaders Network podcast. Howden Group is the second largest insurance broker in the UK, and they pride themselves on being specialists within the care sector. Their aim is to help care leaders build remarkable care organisations by providing them with a unique experience and also the best possible deal. To learn more about their tailored insurance solutions, head to howdengroup.com. Sure. I mean, it's um, obviously an incredibly sad set of circumstances where uh, somebody's died, obviously, in a, in, in a choking scenario. Um, I, I guess the 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 important thing is the as you say from a provider perspective it's it's really really key to make sure that the lessons are learned that that scenario shouldn't play out in the in the, in the future um i can imagine of course there's going to be implications for the for the uh for the for the family members of course of that uh, of the uh, of the deceased um i guess the conversation for today of course is focused on the inquest and the process and the kind of the practical uh side of side of things but i guess it kind of takes makes sense to, to kind of pause for a moment just in that scenario obviously the the, the fact that it's um uh uh, uh extremely uh, an emotive set of circumstances for for, for everyone involved so if you could talk me through what actually happens during the course of an inquisition, I think that would be a really logical next uh, point for us to, to unpack together. Yeah. So um, during the course of an inquest, well, there's different stages to it. You have the lead up to the inquest and that involves all the preparation. So that's getting witness statements together, evidence and providing that to the coroner. Then you've got the actual hearing itself. Um, so when a hearing takes place, um, a lot of the time it's done face to face or it can be done virtually, um, but the, the same principles apply. Um, and it's if it's a face to face uh, inquest, it's, it's less formal than a, 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 a typical court setting. So, um, you know, criminal courts, for example, they're very different to um, a, a, a coroner's court um but you know no, it's 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 not uh, any less daunting for witnesses and especially if they've never been called to an inquest before it can be quite um you know quite nerve-wracking for them so um i think to help with that and to alleviate concerns the key the key thing really is preparation and i think if you have lawyers involved who have taken you through the process of taking a witness statement from you um, supporting you with um, evidence and and just talking you through what's going to happen I think that can really help um, a witness to feel assured and know what to expect during the actual hearing itself um, so what will happen practically is a witness will be called to um, swear an oath or take an affirmation and and then they'll they'll start uh, the, the the coroner will ask them questions um, interested persons, they will then have the opportunity to ask questions. So, for example, the deceased family members um, and, and a, a, a jury would then have the opportunity to ask questions if a jury was engaged. Um, 
what I always say to witnesses is it's very helpful to have a hard copy of their statement in front of them. Um, it, it helps them to know what they've said. Um, you know, like, as I've just mentioned, they can be very nervous when giving evidence, but if they've got a hard copy of their statement in front of them, they've got that to refer to, they can refresh their memory, you know, it's not a memory test. And this is all about assisting the coroner with their investigation. Um, so that's that's sort of what happens on the day. Um, the coroner will then um, go away and, and, and consider their conclusion, um, and then they'll issue their conclusion. So that's the sort of process uh, during during an inquest hearing. Okay, thanks for thanks for explaining that 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 last point. Um, so talk me through um, the, the the length of a, a, a of an inquest usually from the from the point of uh, when the the incident happens all the way through to the conclusion. How long would that process typically typically take? Yeah, I mean, typically, typically it's twelve months from when the incident happens to when. Um, the actual inquest hearing takes place. However, there was a significant delay with COVID. Um, so I, I, a lot of cases I'm working on at the moment, they, it's going way beyond this 12 month period. Um, yeah. Also, there's different variations to that. I mean, sometimes it can happen a lot sooner. Coroners have different workloads. So it, it's kind of hard to give you um, an exact answer to that because it, it, it really does vary. Um, so yeah, it depends basically. Sure, but twelve months would be a. a I'd say on average, I think talking well. terms of averages, yeah. Because it's quite, I guess that presents lots of opportunity for for, for preparation, but then also probably quite a, a lot of time for for nervousness as well. Uh, you you kind of hope that the people that are involved in the process haven't got too much experience in that world, because of course there's a reason why there's an inquest happening, uh, and I guess for the. For the for the for the non legal team, of course, the legal team kind of this is the the, the day to day uh, a lot of the day to day focus of what they're what they're doing. For the people that aren't maybe so experienced in this, I can imagine that having that support from a legal team who have got the experience who can map out the process, um, help manage expectations around kind of all of the various different elements. Uh, that's it, it's that the, the the reassurance around how it's likely to to play out and things that's going to be going to be super super important. So, um, yeah. so it within that process, the 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 coroner, of course, is going to start drawing some some conclusions around the the set of circumstances, exact uh, etc. What what are the possible conclusions that the co coroner can draw in, in in that in that set of circumstances? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, obviously the, the coroner is asking the four questions, the who, when, where and how the person died. Um, there's different types of conclusions. So you can have a short form conclusion and that short form conclusion could be um, accident, misadventure, unlawful, uh, unlawful killing, suicide. Um, there's also narrative uh, conclusions and that's a, a description about how the person came by their came to their death um so they're, they're, they're the different kinds of conclusions um information often arises during an inquest which um means that you know uh for example an, 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 an interested person might want to um, pursue some kind of civil liability, a civil claim in relation to the deceased person's death. Um, and so they they might use some of the evidence that has come out during the hearing to support a potential claim. Um, so whilst there's no civil or criminal liability attached, um, it can lead on to other action being taken. Um, in terms of a negative conclusion, sometimes um, there might be what's known as a neglect rider um, and, and wording might might in this neglect rider, the, the wording might include um, a gross failure to provide basic care. Um, you know, the deceased condition was known or ought to have been known and, and certain action was required to be taken. Um, so they're the kind of things that you want to avoid. Um, but that's why you know um preparation is so key in, and making sure that the the right evidence and and is is elicited and, and put before the coroner so that they can investigate fully and, and helping helping the coroner with that process 
quick word about one of the sponsors who helps make the Care Leaders Network podcast possible. Bev and Britain works in partnership with the social care sector, delivering high quality legal and regulatory advice. Their award winning teams across the UK provide workforce, regulatory, corporate, commercial, real estate and litigation advice. And their team truly believes in strong partnerships. They really understand what it takes to deliver outstanding care and to build a thriving business. To find out more, head to bevanbritain.com. Sure. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes that makes total sense. So um, obviously these are really, really important circumstances of course they need to be dealt with correctly and i guess the the because of the uh the these types of scenarios there's going to be an impact of the inquest on the on the provider itself can you talk me through some of those potential impacts the different things that might kind of play out as a result of uh, an inquest happening yeah absolutely so um the potential impact is is very wide um, so I, I, if we talk about um, prevention of future death reports, first of all, they're, um, they're known as uh, their Regulation 28 uh, PFD reports, and the coroner has a duty to issue them. So that's if they've got concerns um, arising from things that have come up during the course of an inquest. Um, and what it does is it highlights in a very public way um, potential issues with a provider. So things that a provider wouldn't necessarily want the public to know. It's a, it's a public report. The provider has to respond within 56, 56 days. Um, and, you know, that, that's the kind of thing you want to avoid. And a way to avoid that is to show that lessons have been learned and um, remedial action has been taken. I mean, that's, that's one of the ways of trying to reduce the risk. Um, on the back of PFD, PFD reports, you can get um, adverse uh, adverse regulatory attention. So in the form of CQC, uh, they might come in and carry out an inspection on the back of it. Um, if it's a provider who has a, a group of homes or, or a number of homes, um, you know, CQC might go in and inspect all the other services just to see if there's a pattern and any trends emerging um so you know that there's that there are two possible outcomes and um, a local authority safeguarding team could also uh take some interest in it and then of course you've got media attention so if there's um you know any kind of adverse uh story about um the care sector that the media often do quite like to jump on it so there's there is that risk there um and you know, we, we often say to providers that it's helpful to um, ha have some a support from um, a PR person, have have a, a press statement prepared in advance, um, just so that it's ready to go once the, the coroner, um, you know, ha has, has, has concluded uh, the inquest. So they're, they're the kind of things um, that could r arise in, in terms of the impact following an in inquest. Got you. Got you. OK, perfect. So there's, there's there are a few different uh, considerations that should be met, I guess, that that, that should be uh, recognised towards the uh, the end of the uh, the inquest inquest process. And I guess it, it, it wouldn't be too much of a surprise if there were uh, local authority uh, inspections or CQC inspections off the off the back of that. They're, they're going to be doing their job. They're going to be making sure that the standards are being upheld within the uh, within the services. And of course, to, to your point, they've 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 they really got to scratch under the surface and make sure that there aren't trends, uh, and also that the, those lessons have been have been learned. You you'd like to think that a, a good quality provider, if if the worst came to the worst and there was a, there was an inquest around something um, uh, that had happened and there were um, there were there were there were mistakes that have been made. <clears throat> Nobody wants to be in that set of circumstances. Uh, of course, there are um, uh, the. Accidents, of course, unfortunately, can can happen, but they're, they're, there's an awful lot that can be put into place to make sure that these things aren't, uh, uh, I guess, kind of the unfortunate reality that they that they are, uh, uh, unfortunately, occasionally. So it's building in the systems and processes, making sure that the uh, the, the kind of underpinning culture of the organisation is very much one of an open learning culture where people can admit where they maybe there have been faults um but they're 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 willing and open to to be able to take action uh, against that and make sure that the the risks are mitigated in the in the future so um really really helpful thank you so much for for breaking that 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 down for me of course 
if, if people are interested in asking more questions, uh, uh, they can they can reach you directly um, uh, uh, through the through the website, etc. But it's been been good to be able to connect. Thank you so much for your time today. And I appreciate it. Thanks, Simon. It's been great. Thank you.